Hi, I'm James Kotecki. You're here with me in the C-Space studio here at CES 2020. And here with us, Oren Katzef, president of Condé Nast Entertainment. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for being here. So Condé Nast, it's a name I'm sure many people have heard of. There's a lot of brands and assets mm -hmm. under that umbrella. So can you first just kind of contextualize for us what is under that umbrella? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, that's where I think you should always start with Condé Nast is the amazing brands and amazing editors that we have from Vogue to Wired to Bon Appetit to GQ to Glamour some of the world's best brands that it really have, have, have ever been made. And from a Condé Nast Entertainment standpoint, what we're doing is we're, we're working with those editors, we're, we're essentially shepherding those brands into the next wave of video, revenue, platforms, monetization opportunities, but really starting at that core, which is we have audiences trust in the creation of those brands and everything we've done with it over the years. And my job, if I do it right, from a digital video and TV and film and podcast standpoint is again, really kind of shepherding those brands into the next wave of these opportunities. Does something unite all of those disparate brands? Is there a Condé Nast, is there something that makes every piece of Condé Nast entertainment unmistakably Condé Nast? Well, I, I think that what uh, every brand has its own unique ethos and voice, so we do have to really be careful. We don't want to create homogenized content across everything we do with sure. Condé Nast Entertainment. But what I would say from a video standpoint, what's unique to us is that we do spend a ton of time thinking about data. We spend a ton of, a ton of time thinking about formats and what works and what doesn't. And the way that that plays out is that when you look at some of the content we create, and, and in many cases with celebrities, if it's, let, let's say, a Billie Eilish or others, oftentimes the content we create with them, the shows we create with them, do more views than any other content they create outside of, let's say, a music video. So there's something to hmm. the secret sauce we have and to the time we spend and how we think about every single video we create. So the brand uh, that unites them is that it's good content. That's right. Yeah, um, yeah, good content, <laughs> I think, at the end of the day. It's a good brand to have. Good content wins yeah. out at the end of the day. And what are some of the movies, TV shows people might be familiar with? So uh, uh, two years ago, we had two of Netflix's most binge-watched shows in Last Chance You, which is actually based yep. on IP from, uh, from GQ. Uh, great, and, and then a show called Fastest Car, uh, which is on Netflix as well, so two very binge watch shows. And then we have a, a, a film that came out about a year and a half ago called The Old Man and the Gun with Robert Redford. He got a Golden Globe nomination that was based on a New Yorker article. So we're very active in the TV and film space, and in that case, often every day trying to leverage IP from print and give it legs beyond print in the TV and film. So what does your data say about the way people are consuming this content these days and the trends that you see where this is going? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. You know, I, I'd say that um, what we're saying is that, in our case at least, people are really receptive and, and actively wanting longer and longer content. I mean, we do have our, you know, our 60 second content we put on Instagram, let's say. We have our two and three minute content, but we've got shows that go all the way up to 45 minutes. And we really look at the data around engagement to make sure that a 45 minute show is actually being watched. And, and what we're seeing is that as long as the content is great, as long as you're telling a great story, in the case of let's say Bon Appetit, we have a show called Gourmet Makes with Claire Saffitz, who's one of our top in-house talent. Uh, that show is about 45 minutes long and it does over 5 million views an episode and the engagement's fantastic. And again, what we're seeing there is that when you entertain people, when you inspire them, when you're in this case, you're sort of, we're at the intersection of entertainment and utility, uh, they watch, they're excited. They'll go all the way to the 45 minute mar mark to watch your content. Does it make sense anymore to think about uh, TV and film and online video as distinct entities or is it all yeah. just kind of this blend? It's all video and it's just a matter right. of what screen I'm watching. It I on. think it's a great question. I think about that all the time. And, and, and part of how I, I answer that is uh, what I think is interesting is you know, w when you're on Netflix, and you decide something to watch, you don't really know what it is until you click on that box, right? And is it 22 minutes? Is it 90 minutes? Is yeah. it three hours? Uh, so the line between what a film is and what a TV show is has never been more blurry. And so from our standpoint, the way we look at it is, and, and even you know, within my traditional team that does TV and film, they've never been more collaborative. There's never been more overlap between a project that someone on the TV side might take and someone on the film side might take. I think it's, again, because the definition of what TV and film is from an audience standpoint, I don't know that they care as much. They just want great mm -hmm. content. And again, is it 20 minutes? Is it 60 minutes? If you can entertain them for 60 minutes, they're going to love it. And if yeah. you can entertain them for 20 minutes in a 20 minute show, they'll love that too. Sure, we go for 10 minutes a piece in this, uh, in this studio here. Um, and clearly uh, you've, you've uh, determined uh, that's the exact right 10 time. minutes is our sweet spot, yeah. and you're right. It, it, it's, it's totally context dependent. <laughs> Yeah. So when you're looking at people, I assume people come to you all the time with pitches for new shows and your team is trying to figure out what you green light, what you make, what you don't. How do you use 
data to help figure that out? Yeah. And then how do you use intuition and good old fashioned human creativity? It, it really is. I mean, I, I feel like the term, the uh, marriage of art and science is a little bit overused these days, but we, we truly are at the intersection of art and science. There is some gut and some real creativity. Like, you know, the idea behind 73 questions uh, which is one of our landmark yes. series across all c &E. And this but, is a video where someone goes into a celebrity's house and asks them a whole bunch of questions in kind of one continuous take. That's right, yeah. 73 credits. And it started with Sarah Jessica Parker mm -hmm. and the thought of if you had Sarah Jessica Parker for 30 to 45 minutes, what would you do? Yeah. And the creative side of the equation was let's try this. So it, mm -hmm. it has to start with, with the art. But the science side then says, well, where are people, where are they, how long are they watching? Can it be longer? Should it be shorter? Should we tweak the format? Does it need to be one long continuous take? Uh, and, and, as well as you know, data that we're looking at, well, what kind of talent performs better than others? What kind of formats perform better than others? And the reality for us is you know, we, we launched over 100 digital pilots in 2019. And the idea there is you know, this isn't like a $50,000 an episode pilot yeah. like other platforms might be. You truly can test and fail fast and understand what works and what doesn't. And you know, the, the um, uh, one thing I, I like to say just in general about content that works or doesn't work is don't get too attached. If it's not working, you should be okay with letting it go or trying something new. And even if it is working, you know, audiences can get fickle. It doesn't mean it's gonna work forever. Mm -hmm. So you have to be on top of the trends that are working and not working. And even something that's a hit six months ago, make sure you keep it fresh. Mm -hmm. We're talking with Orrin Katz, the president of Condé Nast Entertainment. So your content is not just on one video platform. You mentioned right. you're on Netflix, you're in movie theaters, you're on YouTube, you're all over the place. Is that a deliberate choice? Yeah. And could that change in an era where brands are trying to consolidate their content into a single platform? Yeah, it, it is a deliberate choice. And, and part of that is that there are uh, so many platforms a day and, 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 and such a wide audience that's craving great content that you know, from our standpoint, we want to be everywhere that our fans are. But the caveat I said to that is, we want to be everywhere that they are in a way where we can actually make a business and, and, mm -hmm. and drive revenue. And so when you look at the platforms that we are investing in a little bit more than others, it's places like YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. our own O and O. You mentioned TV and film. You know, those are real business model opportunities where we have a really effective and strong sales team. They're in the marketplace every day selling our premium content and doing a really good job of selling it on those platforms. Um, you'll still see our content on Snap and Instagram and Facebook. It's a little bit of a different revenue model there. But again, the idea is that as we try to build these brands and build audience for video against these brands on these platforms, we really need to be not only where the audience is, but deliver them the right kind of content on the platform they're on, which might mean that 73 Questions is shot a little bit differently for a platform that's not YouTube or ONO because we know the engagement's a certain way wow. on those platforms. Um, does 5G mean things to you as far as the new content you're going to be able to create or, or yeah. distribute? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's still early days, but you know, some of the thoughts we have around 5G are just the accessibility to content. And, and again, it, you know, it, goes, it goes to the idea of where is our audience and on what devices are they watching it and how do we make it as easy as possible, whether it's on our own site or other platforms to access our content, so I think that's one thing is that'll make it easier. I also think that you know, part of what really drives our business is the work we do with advertisers and the content mm -hmm. we create with advertisers. And I, I think, you know, I think it, it's still, we're in the early innings obviously, but I, I do think 5G should and could present new advertiser mm -hmm. opportunities in some of the work that we do. One thing that takes a lot of bandwidth is VR. I know you've done some work in that space, that kind of immersive yeah, experiential yeah. space. Uh, how do you think about that going forward? Yeah, we, we think about VR as we do a lot of parts of our business, business, which is we're all about experimenting. We're all about kind of diving in uh, and, and testing things out. Again, it, it also comes back to there's got to be a model and there's got to be an audience for it. And we've seen some, some, you know, some pretty good results to what we've done so far. As we look at 2020 and beyond, there's a couple other things we're working on, but again, it all comes within the business discipline umbrella, meaning we've got to make sure we've got a big enough audience to enjoy it and that there's a business model behind it. So uh, as I was prepping these questions, I have this question. I think it's only for you, the only guest I'm going to ask this to. Uh -huh. uh, I just figured you'd be the right person yeah. to ask. Would you rather have <laughs> an A-plus team using older technology mm -hmm. or a B team with the latest gear? God. And I don't get to get a, I don't get to choose A plus on both. Uh, you know what? This well, is the C space studio, yeah. and anything's possible. But well, I, I guess I'm just curious, yeah, like, what's the relationship I, I get, between technology and people? I, I would say I, I always go for A plus people. I, I really do. I, I think that when you have a strong team, especially in a creative world, that are working well together, it, it's like having a team on the football field or a team on the basketball court. And when everything's gelling and they're working well together, you see the results in the content. And I think that an A plus team, in many ways, can make up 
for tech not being exactly where you're not having A plus tech. Yeah. When they're gelling, when they're working well together, it makes up for a lot. So Just I'll like the team at Last Chance U. That's right, uh, exactly. <laughs> which was a great show. Uh, yeah. Orrin Katz, the president of Condé Nast Entertainment. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Absolutely, thank for you. For being here in the C Space studio. Thank you. And thank you so much for watching. I'm James Kotecki, your host in the C Space studio. Please keep it right here because more great conversations from CES 2020 are coming your way. Thank you.